I think, so my responsibilities after taking some time, we had to think about what did we have? What did we do? What aren't we doing that we should be doing? And there were some of those. And then, you know, like, where are we going to go from there? Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello, and welcome to the Revenue Insights Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Pilar Schenk, Chief Operating Officer of Cisco Global Security and Collaboration. She's got a wealth of experience across operations at Cisco, McAfee, and Dell. Pilar, it's wonderful to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Lee. It's lovely to meet you as well. Thank you. Um, tell us a little more about your story. You've been at so many different uh, like enterprise-sized companies. I'd love to hear it from your perspective of the journey that you've been on to get to where you are today. Sure. Um, you know, I think that uh, I really grew up at Dell. Um, so I spent 15 years at Dell. Uh, and Dell was a wonderful place to start my career because I was able to really discover what I loved and what I was good at. Uh, and within Dell, I did lots of different things. I think every two, two and a half, maybe three at the most years, I would do something different. So I did, you know, the sales transformation the first time we created specialists. And how does that work? And how do we get generalists and specialists to work together and the sales model and the training and the profiling, all the rest of the components of it? I did our, um, I ran BI for sales and finance. So everything that went Michael all the way down to our reps. What's our management system? What should we look at? Um, I raised my hand when we bought EMC. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the largest tech merger ever. I knew nothing about integration. So, hey, I, I'd like to do that. Um, and, uh, I ran the IT component of the EMC integration. Um, you know, anything from sales ops, I ran channel sales ops. We grew that business from 29 billion to 35 billion. I guess the commonality in my time at Dell, um, and what I learned about myself is that I really love change. Um, I'm actually really awful when things are pretty uh, normal and steady. I become very unhappy. Um, I really like change. I really like being close to the customer. I like being close to the sales teams and I love to drive growth. After 15 years of Dell, all of that change and like learning, there were less places that I felt like I could get that incremental learning. It became um, like that incremental value of doing that next job was just a little bit less interesting. And I've had a lot of mentors who said, Two things. One, um, great career at Dell, but unless you want to retire them you, there, you need to do something outside, um, which I thought was great advice. Or, um, you know, people are going to think that you're kind of a one trick person that can only work within one company. And then second, by the way, hardware, you know, Dell's done amazingly um, well. However, most of the growth right now and margin is in the SaaS business. Um, So uh, I switched gears. I went over to McAfee. McAfee was private equity owned. Um, I got to, you know, in comparison to Dell, you know, McAfee was small, right? We were a couple billion dollars in um, uh, overall. We had about 1,700 sellers and it was like moving a speedboat. Um, And we were, you know, in the world of cybersecurity, which was a business that, you know, our market that was growing double digits, we were growing, you know, negative double digits. Uh, I really feel like when you try find a market that's growing double digits and you're not, then like the balls in your court. Um, and so we fixed the business. We turned it around, did a lot of things there and uh, we IPO'd and then sold it off. Um, Cisco. So why go back big again? Yeah. Uh, Cisco only a year. And, um, you know, I had heard amazing things about Cisco in terms of like the type of people and the culture, which I think is incredibly true. And then collaboration was another one of those businesses where the market was growing um, and we were not. Um, and so it needed some opportunity to turn the business around and figure out what we needed to go do. And uh, so I came over here to try to fix the collaboration business. And then most recently, um, on my one year anniversary, they gifted me with security. Um, so getting nice. back to my cybersecurity roots. 
So lots of um, change, lots of different roles. Um, I think that's by design. It's what I really, really enjoy. But I think the consistent theme is I really like driving change and transformation. Amazing. And I love that you've been on the journey really from originally, you know, kind of a sales ops type role through to, we'll touch on revenue operations a little bit more, but I love that in the role that you're in now, it's very much around collaboration. So actually what I'm really intrigued by is what are your responsibilities? Because I've come across um, businesses, you know, that are, oh, you know, we're so big that actually uh, implementing uh, like revenue operations and getting that alignment is really difficult. And by the sounds of it, and I'm hoping you'll be able to fill in the gaps a little bit more, it sounds like uh, at Cisco, it's very different. Actually, it's quite a mature approach to how you're getting teams to collaborate together. Uh, so you want to talk about collaboration or how the RevOps or sales ops organizations are structured? Yeah. Let's start with um, like your role more specifically in terms of uh, well collaboration. Yeah. So um, my official title is COO of the Collaboration and Security Businesses. And you say, okay, well, what does that mean? And I think just um, COO and uh, rev ops, sales ops, commercial ops, biz ops, um, all of the yep. functions differ. And I, th- I think they differ by design in each company. Uh, and you have to look underneath it. When I joined the collaboration organization, they had a decentralized approach to operations. Um, so there were lots of different functions and lots of different places. And they kind of handed it all together and said, you know, go figure that out. Um, I think, so my responsibilities after taking some time, we had to think about um, what do we have? What did we do? What aren't we doing that we should be doing? And there were some of those. And then, you know, like, where are we going to go from there? Um, uh, we landed on five different kind of towers for our organization. Um, the first tower is acceleration, which, you know, I think sometimes it's an operation, sometimes it does not. But um, this is where we're, you know, we spend a lot of time with customers. But then we take all of that input that we know from a customer perspective um, deals and things like that. And we're, you know, becoming very incremental in terms of how we're bringing that back to our sales organization. So sales plays, enablement, content, really thinking about like what, how, what's the best way, for example, to position a particular product or what's the best way to have the conversation around hybrid work. And then bringing that instead of a one to one, one to many across the sales organization. The second function I have is go to market strategy and planning, which is, you know, I think more normal, right? But that would be, you know, if I had a dollar, where would I take it from and where would I put it? Um, what's our capacity model? You know, what's our segmentation model? Which market should we go after? Which segment should we go after? What's our TMY? Um, strategic growth projects. Uh, what's our strategy for the year? We have then um, the third tower is business transformation, which is really around process and tech stack. Um, which we've done a ton of work on seller experience, which is, you know, how do we improve the seller experience? And then we have some kind of support functions, things that are just really difficult, especially in a big company, you find things that are kind of just like, oh, that's really tough. Like, let's just put some help there. Um, but they're really figuring out how do we improve productivity in the seller experience? Um, and then last but not least, I think what every operations organization has is sales insights. So what you find in a typical BI function, plus, you know, we actually put our territory and comp execution there and some of our geo-based support. Uh, I don't call it BI um, because I like to focus on outcomes. And so the leader I have that is in that place, you know, really focus on what we want to drive, which are insights rather than, you know, hey, look, I deliver lots of reports. So five towers is where we landed. Um, but I think... And every organization is different. And I think it's different by design because the companies need different things. And so you have to understand where the company's at, what the teams need, and then go from there. Uh, obviously, in RevOps, true RevOps, I think you often see things like um, marketing demand gen. Sometimes you see CS. Um, you can see deal desk, uh, you know, comp design and comp execution. I mean, there's there's lots and lots of varying forms of operations organizations and Again, you know, it just depends on what the organization needs and I think where they're at from a maturity curve. Thank you so much for the detail. Um, the bit that I was really curious around actually was that the uh, kind of a point that you made at the beginning where when you went in, it was quite uh, to a point decentralized. So um, how, how do you go into an organization such as Cisco, which, you know, huge company and actually unite everyone behind a, a single vision and a single way of, of, of doing things? 
Well, um, fortunately, I don't have to not, uh, unite all of Cisco because that's a tall task. <laughs> but, um, yep. but I did have to unite all of collaboration. Um, and so we have around, let's call it 2,000 people across the collaboration organization. Um, and so I think we're both uniting what is the collaboration organization around, what is the role of ops, um, and also um, my own team, right? Because they have to feel, you know, really compelled with this future state vision and super excited. And, you know, in some cases their roles change and, you know, that sometimes is a good thing and sometimes it's not. Um, I think that's where you do a lot of listening. You start with listening to the business in terms of what they need and listening to the leaders on what they need. Uh, listening to the team on what they need and what they think they can do. And then tying that back into what we think is the future kind of state of the design and making sure that we listen and get feedback on that before we make those moves. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I did it. I would say that in some cases, the organization um, didn't know like what they were missing. Right. And I think this is really common in rev ops and sales ops, which is, um, they don't know maybe what others have or what rev ops or sales ops or whatever we call ourselves and, you know, the particular function could do for them. Um, and I think that it's been the case in my last two jobs. Um, and I think it's one of those things that we have to shape. Right. And so. For example, um, when I was at McAfee, um, I brought in a leader who ran go to market strategy and planning. We didn't have the function. Um, and, you know, he came to me after a week or two in the job and said, everybody keeps coming to me and saying, this is your job. And it was like, you know, delivering goal sheets and, you know, um, doing territories. I was like, well, yes, that is part of your job, but we need to teach and help the team see that actually we can do more than that. Um, and we can help them figure out how to grow. Um, and we should be a part of that conversation. And we can do the analysis on which markets to go after, which segments to go after, and how you might do that from a coverage and capacity um, perspective. And so I think even, you know, at Cisco as well, um, sometimes I'll see work and say, actually, we, we can help with that. Um, and I think... Uh, ops, you know, more broadly is going through a change and some companies are in very different places and some leaders, your sales leaders and different folks that you're working with are in very different places and expectations. And our job is to help shape what the scope of the role is and what it really could be, right? And to inspire a little bit of the art of the possible. Mm. And that actually brings really nicely onto something that I'm quite interested to understand because from what you've built out so far, as I kind of mentioned earlier, it sounds like the collaboration function is now quite mature in a sense, right? Out of, you know, such a large company. So comparatively, do you think that many other businesses are kind of on the same tra trajectory in terms of maturity that, that you guys are at? Or do you think you're kind of ahead of the curve? Um, I think we have more to go. Um, like I think bigger companies that have been around for a while, um, have a lot of incredible um, headwinds, right? Or tailwinds, right? And that makes it, you know, way easier. You know, I, our salespeople can call a customer. They probably work with Cisco. They probably buy some networking gear. Um, that, that call is answered. Um, but they also have some tailwinds um, or headwinds on that, right? Which are things that are, make it harder. Uh, we grew up as a hardware company. Um, and we grew up as a networking company. And now for collaboration and security, there are, you know, two of our biggest SaaS businesses, right? Which operate really, really differently in how we look at the business, how we pay our people, what we should be doing, our sales motions. Um, and so whether or not we are out ahead, I don't think so. Uh, I think that um, the role of operations is going through a transformation itself. I've worked for some time in a variety of roles that, you know, look like operations, sound like operations. And I was just joking to someone who I met, I uh, was talking with last night. Operations used to be the function where, you know, like they had an extra finance leader or a sales leader. It's like, well, they don't have anything to do. Let's have them run operations. Um, and, you know, they would come in and great, great leaders can do anything. Um, and it was much more support focused, right? If you need something, I'll get it done. Project management, give me a report. Um, what I've seen over the years is that started to shift and the organizations that are really taking advantage of the talent and the capability 
are starting to say, hey, you know what? If I had a dollar, where would I take it from and where would I put it? Um, and now go figure out how you take that strategy and execute all the way down the pipe. Or like, tell me what's wrong in my, you know, markets out in APJC. Tell me what's wrong with my, you know, tier one countries versus, you know, what is our strategy for tier two or some smaller countries? And what, how should I go to market and what should be my routes? And, you know, how do I think about SP? Um, and, you know, service provider. So I think the role has gone through a massive shift. Um, and I think companies are in very different places along that journey. My sense is that companies that are born in the cloud, you know, SaaS companies, startups are like their um, start in a, in a more advanced place in terms of how they look at rev ops and sales ops and all the different ops functions. I also think that's because they have to be like they're very, very scrappy and they have to constantly, you know, their lifeblood is growth. Their lifeblood is, you know, new business. And so you want to go after new business, get a really good rev ops team in, in, in place and really, you know, capitalize on your data and the sales tools and all the things that are out there. And companies that have been around for a while um, are in varying uh, places on that transition. So on the topic of talent, um, is there a certain uh, other characteristics that you look for in, a, in an operations person? Or is it, you know, are you looking at experience? Are you looking at potential? I'd love to know a little bit more. Um, well, I always hire for potential, personally. Um, I think smart people can do anything. Um, but uh, I think if you think the, org- the functions going through a transition, then the talent that you have is going to vary greatly. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who are really good at working with a sales leader and supporting. You need something, you need a report, I'll go pull it. You want me to go figure out what's going on with the forecast for today? I'll go do that. You want me to get a goal sheet out? Got it. Um, and that's awesome. And really, really, you know, like the, that's a needed function. Um, where I struggle uh, to find talent um, and often have to build it are the people who can really do the go-to-market strategy work and the sales play work. Um, go to market strategy, you know, where, if I take a dollar, where do I put it? Um, what should be my SP strategy in tier three countries is heavily analytical. It's very consultative. Um, and, you know, it can become either like a strategic white paper, which is not, you know, super helpful in sales. And by the way, we're still measured on a, like targets and growth. So it needs to actually be something that we can do something with. And the people who are really good at the support. You know, know the business. They know what's going on with customers. They can know with sales, but can they still take a step back, dig into the numbers, come back out and say, you know, in one slide with one amazing chart, this is what you should, where you should be headed and why. Um, so I think that's a, it's a function that is very, very hard to hire for. Um, and, uh, I, we often, um, will build it in terms of finding people who are heavy analytical, consultative, and then figuring out how we grow it. Mm. Yeah, I, definitely from from my perspective, interviewing lots of RevOps leaders, that's typically, you know, quite an analytical mindset, uh, mindset. love getting into the numbers, um, love also problem solving as well, I think is another one, um, but particularly with like a lot of this, uh, with a lot of the strategic elements, right? To move us away from that ever so slightly, I'm, and this is going to be a fairly broad question, but I'm yeah. intrigued to know what has been the biggest challenge that you have faced in, let's say, the last 12 months? And how have you been, well, either, uh, a, either able to overcome it or how are you uh, approaching overcoming it at, at the minute? Um, last 12 months. Uh, well, so 12 months, I really was n- new to Cisco. You know, I started a year ago. One of the things that was incredibly challenging when I started within the collaboration business is that we didn't have uh, visibility, a lot of visibility to our numbers. Um, and you think, well, you know, Cisco is a huge company. They've been around forever. What do you, what do you mean? Like, and that's kind of where I was. Uh, a major well, problem. <laughs> how is that, how is that possible? Um, and I think the reason behind that is collaboration is a different business, right? Again, like a, a more SaaS based business in a bigger hardware, um, company. Uh, Cisco has a very established version of Salesforce called Salesforce main, right? That most of our account teams use. And we were able to look at it, but not really change anything in it. Um, and, you know, in a SaaS company, you often have a very different tech stack. Um, so, you know, I, I started um, and I found, you know, a lot of our forecast calls were run out of like Excel. Um, and, you know, wow, 
right? You know, this is really, <laughs> really kind. Um, and so uh, we had to figure out what to go do. And I think that one of the biggest challenges was how quickly can we make that move? Like, how do you run a business if you can't see your numbers um, and pull levers um, and hold people accountable so you can have a great strategy, but no one really knows? Um, that's a no go. Um, and so we made a really big shift. And three months after I joined, we launched our own instance of Salesforce. Now, of course, it's really important. We're a brighter Cisco. We want to show up to customers in the way that we have like hub and spoke, which means, you know, what's happening in ours goes into the main and vice versa. But the idea that we couldn't really um, change things in the main instance of Salesforce, we couldn't run our own deals, those kind of things was just a no-go. Um, so that was a big, big challenge, rolling out Salesforce, um, a new instance for you know a couple thousand sellers really, really quickly was a big deal. Um, on top of Salesforce, you think, okay, well, cool. You have Salesforce, you can do lots of things when you get that right, but you're still missing lots of other things that you we might be able to use in our sales process. What's going on in activity level? What's going on with forecasting? Do we have sales cadences set up? What's our engagement? All sorts of other stuff that's pretty normal in a SaaS company. So the next question we had to face was how quickly could we add to our tech stack to start to get some of that visibility um, that is a competitive advantage for our competitors and was not for us. Um, so in the last... I guess in a period of four months, we rolled out Salesforce, we lo- rolled out a forecasting module, and we rolled out sales cadences. Um, uh, so it was a pretty significant change. Um, you know, I don't think the sellers were used to that level of uh, capability in a tech stack, also that level of accountability. Um, you know, our sales leader jokes, you know, uh, jokes kind of, that's like, there's nowhere to hide now. And it's true. I mean, we have yeah. incredible visibility. And then we, we coupled all that with a really great um, team underneath uh, that does the sales insights. And so, you know, they've put all of that in a data source. We're able to, you know, spit out things in a hundred ways to Sunday, you know, at the rep level, at manager level and so forth. So I think for me, just biggest challenge was coming in as like, oh my gosh, we don't actually have visibility to our business. Getting business visibility to our business wasn't just creating some reports. We didn't have the data layer. Um, and to get the data layer, you had to evolve the tech stack. Um, and those changes often take a long time. Um, and we didn't have a long time. Uh, so how quickly could we move? Um, how quickly could we get full adoption? Um, and how quickly could we change kind of the sales process for the collaboration team? Yeah, I'm actually impressed that you were able to turn all of that around quite so quickly, right? And so what does that tech stack look a little bit more like now? You've obviously had it even more time since then. Um, and now you've got cases in place and you've got more of a, a, a foundational layer, I'd say. Um, what are the core components of your tech stack as of today? Well, um, we have three, I mean, the three major components that we rolled out. And, and by the way, we took a pause after those three intentionally, right? Um, obviously, CRM, um, forecasting, and cadences were the three areas that we focused on first. Um, we are looking at account planning, um, right? And the, the, the right tools underneath that. And we're looking at engagement and content, content management. We have LMS already. Um, so we haven't gone... Um, we roll all of that out between December and April, and then we stopped. Yeah, our end of year is in July. Um, we wanted to land the plane with those areas, um, and we were also doing things, you know, around our strategy. So we stood up a sales play engine. We had ch- changed the go-to-market strategy. We were asking people to run sales plays and you know, manage their pipeline differently than they had. And by the way, we're going to hold you super accountable to forecasting. And, you know, have you heard of commit coverage? And why is it low? And, you know, what's your confidence? And feelings don't belong in forecast calls. And so, you know, it's one thing to be able to figure out, like, how technically to deliver it. It's a whole nother thing to change everyone's habits every day. And so we focused on those um, capabilities first. Um, and then... Rolled it all out. And, you know, I was just joking with a leader who did it yesterday because I told her, look, we're going to move really fast. And I don't, we're going to move so fast intentionally. I don't need everything to be an A. 
um, which was really hard for her. Like in this case, a B minus might be okay because we're going to go so fast that you're not going to be able to have an A. But fast is more important than getting this out over the next two years. Um, and so we'll fix it over time. Um, so w- technically you have to get it out, but then you have to get everybody to use it and use it differently and change the sales process. And so that's what we spended the, spent the rest of the year on was rather than continuing to roll, you know, capability, um, let's learn to use the capability we have. Yeah, I love that. I, um, perfectionism's the enemy of progress, right? That's right. And love, love the idea of just, you know, let's learn as we go and actually use that to improve it as, as you progress. Um, something that I'm, that I was really curious to ask before we jumped on the call today. I believe you like the saying, together is power, correct? Um, I do. So how, how do you recommend businesses actually begin? Uh, and to use one of my phrases that I like, uh, singing from the same hymn sheet. How, how do you embrace this ethos of together is power? Um, yeah, I, I love the saying together is power. I did, um, lift it from our former CEO at McAfee, who now works at, uh, uh, for Microsoft under Satya. Um, but I do think, um, we become much more powerful when we're not one to one, right? When we can be one to many, um, we can, uh, you know, you can put all the resources of, you know, Cisco up, um, to, to help our customers achieve their goals. We're way more powerful. Um, but that's the hard part, right? Is getting everybody on, you know, is a singing to the same, you know, tune or, you know, getting us, you know, orchestrated team. Uh, I think it requires a lot of conversations. And so, uh, my belief is one of the roles in, in my teams is that we should lead, uh, figuring out what is the tune we want to sing, you know, whatever, you know, whatever analogy you want to use, but what is our strategy? Um, and I think we too often either do it in a vacuum, like it's Lee's strategy or Polar's strategy. And then by the way, I'm telling it to you and you're like, yeah, thanks, but you missed this and you missed that. Um, or, um, we're just not super clear on what our strategy is. Um, and so it's like, yeah, that's not really a strategy. Um, so I think our role and how you get people to sing to the same tune is really spending time listening. Um, you're certainly serving up the numbers. Um, and then coming through, I, I like to, you know, kind of use an approach where you have facts and you have alternatives and you get people deeply invested and debate so that when you land on where you are on those alternatives, like this is the place we need to go. Um, people understand why we didn't go another direction. Then I think the next step along that is, okay, if you have a really strong strategy, how are you communicating it? How are you enabling it? Does it match what you're doing in hiring profiles? Does it match what you're doing in performance recognition? And probably one that I use a lot is um, what I call business management system, which is how do you take your strategy into execution? So what's your cadences? If it's important, you should be spending time on it. Um, what's your reporting for it? Like, how do you see that show up in, you know, um, in metrics? And, you know, sometimes we just enable a CRO but the, probably the people that are the most important and enabling a strategy is the frontline manager. It's not just our CRO not to you know, say they're not important. It's actually the frontline manager. So how are they seeing something different? Um, so I think it's probably the hardest thing to do because, you know, if you want me to go figure out a strategy or, you know, figure out, you know, some level of an analysis, I can do that. But getting people to all row together or sing the same tune um, is way, way harder. Um, and there's lots of options to do different things, but if you can get people lined up, um, I think, you know, we're, I, I, more often than not, I think we have a great opportunity to be successful. Yeah, I, I agree. It can be so incredibly powerful when everyone is, and, you know, going back to one of the first questions I asked of getting people behind, you know, unified behind a single vision, a single mission, when, when you have that, I think you tend to find beautiful things start to happen. And obviously the difficulty becomes um, as you as you grow and you start to employ more people is how do you keep that in place? And how do you keep people aligned to the same vision, to the same goals, and then actually start to build that out over everything else that you're beginning to create, um, which is challenging, I'm sure. Last Last question that I want to ask, what is one book that you would recommend to other operations leaders? Um, my favorite book, uh, that I recommend people to read, um, and I've recommended it on my, to my team is a book called Great at Work. 
Um, and uh, Create at Work is really simple. It's a quick read um, and it's heavily analytical. Um, so, you know, I think it's really practical. But the concept of Great at Work um, is that the most successful people or their most successful organizations pick a couple of things and they obsess about them. Um, and how, you know, to, what to do if you have a boss that, you know, maybe is a very creative thinker and is constantly coming to you, you know, to chase this squirrel and that squirrel and this and that, right? Because that that's not going to make you or the organization as successful. Um, and so in the book, they have this phrase, do less than obsess. Um, and I really, really think it is incredibly important. There's so much coming at us every day. Customers, um, internally within our teams, lots of great ideas. We have all this amazing content. Like there's, there's a lot out there more than ever. Um, but it's a lot to consume and figure out what are the places that I'm really going to spend my bucks on. I'm really going to spend my time on. And how do I be consistent? How am I consistent with that? Um, and so. I really think that um, learning to figure out um, what are those really important things, which is that strategic planning process we just talked about, um, listening, learning, probably finding out that maybe what you originally thought wasn't right, but like really figuring out what are those couple things and then being obsessed about them. And sometimes consistency is incredibly important. You know, if you're, if our do less and obsess is we pick three things, but then a quarter from now we pick three new things. And then a quarter from now we pick three new, you know, more things like, hey, we're going to do Salesforce and our forecasting and cadence. And then we're going to do nothing else but landing those things for another two quarters after that. Like you have to pick a couple things. And I think you have to be incredibly consistent about it. So I love great at work. It's a super practical read. Um, I do think, um, we have more information and more data than ever coming at us. Um, but the trick is figuring out how to consume that all and pick a couple arrows and stick with those arrows and obsess about them. Excellent recommendation. Uh, we'll definitely include a link down in the show, show notes below. Pilar, thank you so much again for, for joining us. For, for anyone that's listening and um, wants to hear more about what you're working on at Cisco, hear more about uh, Together is Power uh, and more of your thoughts, where can they find you? you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, so there's certainly, you know, other, uh, podcasts, webinars and things like that. And I always love to, uh, keep in touch with people. I learn a lot from conversations I have with other leaders who have what problems they're facing, what they're doing, um, you know, what we're doing, comparing notes. And so, you know, find me on LinkedIn. Amazing. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much again. It's been an absolute joy to have you on the podcast today and to everyone that's been listening. Thanks so much. We'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to Revenue Insights. If you want to learn more, subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.